Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord today? All right, there is joy in our hearts all because of what Jesus has done. So let's worship him today. Come on. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Come on, Lord, let's sing. There's no in the house of the Lord. We sing to the God who always makes a way. And this is why, because he hung up on that cross.
perfect son of God in all his innocence you're walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief man of sorrow son of suffering blood and tears how can there's a God who weeps, there's a God who believes, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the Son of suffering.
the free. Thank you for the free to be fine. Blood and tears. How can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Son. to the King of Kings. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're preparing to open our altars for prayer this morning, but before we do, I want you to hear the word of the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31 verse 3. He says, this is God speaking, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. I love how the message version of the Bible puts it. It says it like this. I've never quit loving you, and I never will. (laughs) Then it says, expect love, love, and more love. (laughs) Friends, I've got a message burning in my heart today. It's been there for a couple of weeks, and it's simple. It says, God loves you. No matter where you are or what you're going through, you might feel broken, abandoned, abused. Your body might be letting you down. But friends, the good news is God loves you. (laughs) He loves you. He loves you so much that he did the things we just sang about. He sent his son to earth to weep and to bleed and to live among us and give his life for our sins so that we could be in right relationship with God. And Jesus ascended to heaven and God sent his spirit back to the earth to dwell in the hearts of all of us that believe in him. God loves you and he's here to meet with you today. So as our prayer team prepares to come forward, no matter where you are, what you feel, what you're walking through today, I invite you to these altars today to experience love, love, and more love. Come meet with our prayer team. Come meet with a God that loves you and lay down your needs at his feet as we continue to worship today. This is 
is a place of praise where every demon trembles where we proclaim your name this is a house of healing our hearts are full of So come alive in the name of Jesus, come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus.
still believe. I still believe you're moving. I still believe. Come on, sing it straight to Him. God, I believe you're working. All things for good. I'll fix my eyes on heaven. God, I receive your vision. God, I believe you're working. All things for good. time come alive we sing so come alive in the name of Jesus come alive in the name we declare of today Jesus. this is a house of miracles we bring everything to the feet of Jesus everything in the name of Jesus this is a house of Amen. Come on, give him praise. He's worthy. You are worthy, O oh Lord. Bless your name. Say hallelujah to you, Lord. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 28. Beginning in verse 6, David writes this. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy and I will give thanks to him in song. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. I got so excited in the first service when Pastor Jason opened up our altar time and shared from the prophet Jeremiah and shared what he shared on his heart because when I was reading these scriptures this morning, thinking about our time here, I felt that the Lord just dropped into my mind and in my spirit that, that Brett, there's people that come in and out of this worship service every Sunday or tune in online and you think that nobody sees you and you think that you're unnoticed and God is the God who sees you. And as Pastor Jason said, loves you and is waiting, like this psalm says, for you to call out and to cry out for him in mercy. And he will respond to you. He's the God who's the fortress and the strength of his people. He's the one who shepherds our lives when we let him. And I love what David said. When I think about that, Lord, my heart leaps for joy. I want to respond to you with song and with praise. So I would encourage you as we go into prayer here in just a second, if that's you, you, th you think you're unnoticed. You think you're coming in and out and just doing church on Sunday morning, enjoying it, but never connecting. Let the Lord of all lords, the King of all kings connect with you this morning. Cry out to him. He will hear your cry. Amen. Let's go to him now in prayer. God, we thank you. Thank you for your presence today, oh God. Thank you that you've drawn near your people. And through Pastor Jason a few moments ago and the prophet Jeremiah here in the Psalms, Pastor Kirk in a few moments, God, you're speaking today to say that you love your people and you're drawing us, waiting, Lord, for us to call on you that you might draw us closer to you, to meet our needs, to be our shelter and our fortress. God, I pray for the person that feels just disconnected or alone right now, that they would understand through the authority of your word and by the power of your spirit, that there is not a past that's too broken. There is not a pit of sin too deep. There is not a report from the doctor that's too bleak. There's not a relationship too broken, a family in such duress, Lord, that you cannot step in and heal and be the answer and the provider and the healer. God, we trust you with our lives. Come to those, Lord, that are crying out for mercy, I pray. Rescue them. Be the fortress, the shield, the defender of them. And God, I, I know what this church is going to do. We're going we're to praise you. Our hearts leap for joy already for the last 20 minutes or so. As we think about these songs that we've sung, the truths of your word. God, our hearts are filled with joy because you're the one who's done all these things for your people. So God, we pray what David prayed right near the end of that psalm. Be the shepherd of your people. 
God, we want you to lead and guide our lives. And we as a faith family, we, we recommit ourselves to you this morning to say, God, we belong to you. Lead us and guide us. You see us. You have great love for us. You long to extend your mercy to us. And so, God, we want that kind of God. We want that kind of leader. We want that kind of king over us. And that's you, Jesus. So come and shepherd your people, we pray. We're going to continue to give you the praise. And we give you thanks even now for the hope that we have in you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we offer these prayers. Amen and amen. Come on, let's praise him together one more time. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. We hope you're enjoying this worship gathering from Mount Para North. If this is your first time joining us, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at info at mountparanorth.com or give us a call at 770-578-9081. For more information about all of our ministries and upcoming events, check out our website at mountparanorth.com. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and North Podcast. Whether you are joining us online or in person, it is our hope that you will soon find North to be a place you can call home. And now, let's return to our worship gathering for this week's message. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you today? It is good to see you, but just like Pastor Brett said, it is good to know the Lord is in the house today. Amen? Amen. So grateful you are here today. If you've got your Bibles, take them and turn with me to Psalm 42. Psalm 42, it's going to be on the screen as well, and it's in the, uh, the app if you download the notes. Uh, we are complete, uh, finishing up completing a series we began a few weeks ago called Why God, looking at some of the tough questions. And um, so today we're going to finish up with, why does God seem so far away? Sometimes. Why is it there are times you feel close to God and sometimes you don't feel close to God? Psalm 42, starting in verse 1, it's familiar to some of you, at least part of it, the first part is, but I want to just dive into it if we would. Starting in verse 1, it says, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? Day and night I have only tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, Where is this God of yours? My heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowds of worshipers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Now I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you even from the distant Mount Hermon, the source of the Jordan, from the land of Mount Mizar. I hear the tumult of the raging seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. But each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me. And through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. O God, my rock, I cry, why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones and they scoff. Where is this God of yours? Verse 11. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God and I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today that your word speaks. It was written long ago, but still speaks to circumstances in our hearts today. I pray, Lord, you would anoint the words you've given me to say as they go forth, anoint our ears to hear them and our hearts to receive them so that you may accomplish your perfect will. And we'll give you the praise for it in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. Who is, in your mind, who's the most spiritual person that you know? Think about them for a second. Frame them up in your mind. I mean, when you think about spiritual, when you think about following somebody for Christ, who's the most spiritual person you can think of? All right, you got them? Got them in your head? Some of you have got them in your head. Some of you are cutting your eyes across the room at them. You know them in this room or whatever. You just look up to them. Every single person you've ever met has experienced a spiritually dry time in their life. As a matter of fact, the prophets that we wrote, uh, read this morning, the one from Jeremiah and David, 
Both experienced spiritually difficult, dry times. Wondered where God was in the process. The Bible tells us that Elijah, one of the greatest prophets ever, experienced spiritually dry seasons from the Lord. The psalmist here in chapter 42, the psalmist is not trying to write a song here. I I know some of you have heard the song, As the Deer Pants for the Water, So My Soul Longs for You. He's not trying to write a song, even though it is a song. He's not trying. He's pouring out his heart at this moment. And there's a reason for it. You see, at the moment he's writing this, he is in the upper part of Israel, where after the kingdoms had divided, after David and Solomon, they divided, and the northern ten tribes became the northern kingdom, and the southern two tribes became Judah. The temple is in Judah. The northern tribes have no temple. Jeroboam, who is the king of the northern tribes, does not want them associating with the temple down in the southern tribes for fear that their allegiance would again turn against him and he would lose power. And so instead, he builds these shrines in the upper areas of Israel. And he tells them, if you want to worship God, you can worship your true God, but don't go down to the temple. You can't go there. That's another country now. You come up here and offer your sacrifices to God. It's not the same. It's not what God had prescribed. The psalmist knows this. And so within almost eye shot of the shrine, he stands at the headwaters of the Jordan where they bubble up and begin to flow downhill. And he hears the streams. And he says, as a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. I long to see God, the living God. Not the shrine that's built up here that I've told I can't go anymore to the temple. I long for God. He is in a spiritually dry season, and he longs to get back to the place where he feels close to God again. So, what do you do when God seems far away. I want us to look at this psalm and look at what he is telling us can cause us to draw near to God again. The first thing is this. You have to make God a priority. You have to make him a priority. Verse one and two, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you. This, this is not a, hey, I'm thirsty. This is a, a longing One verse, as the deer pants for the water, I cannot go anymore unless I get near it. He says, so my soul longs for you. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? He's saying the the one thing that I need more than anything else, I need God. You have to make God a priority. And it doesn't just happen, okay? In this world in which we live, There are things clamoring for our attention all of the time, right? When do you make God a priority? This is a typical day for a lot of people. You wake up to, what's the clock called? An alarm clock. It's a terrible name, but it's reality, right? You wake up to an alarm. You wake up in a start. You're startled first thing in the morning. How many of you have ever been sleeping so deep you didn't know where you were, what you were doing, anything like that? I have awakened before and thought I have missed the bus and I didn't do my homework. I am 54 years old. I haven't had homework in a long time and ridden a bus in a long time. And you're startled. You don't don't even know what to think. You, You just wake up. And then you jump out of bed... You get to the coffee pot, right? And then you go get dressed. And if you have children, you have to get those children dressed. And then you scurry out in a start, trying to make it on time, not knowing what Atlanta traffic is like, right? It could be 15 minutes. It could be an hour and 15 minutes. Who knows, you know? So you get out. You get on the road. If you have kids, you get the kids dropped off at school. Then you get to work. And after you drop the kids off, on your way, you turn on your favorite favorite radio broadcast or podcast or something else. And for the mo- a lot of us, you turn on the thing that stresses you out the most, the news. 
Can I t- I'm not telling you to be ill-informed. I get more stressed listening to the news. My, my daughter, for some reason, she, li- she likes these true crime podcasts. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Listen, I don't know. I walk through and I kind of go, what, what, what is happening? The only thing, the only assurance that I have is if I ever kill somebody, she's going to help me bury the body, right? <laughs> I'm, I mean, she's listening to that first thing in the morning. I'll walk out. She's got that going. I'm like, this, this is what we're doing? You listen to something that stresses you out all the way to work. You fight Atlanta traffic. You finally get to work. And when you get to work, everybody is clamoring for your attention, right? You've got to plan that day. You're going to accomplish some things that day, right? I did this past week. I was telling someone, I I came in one day, I had laser-like focus. I mean, I had a rifle shot ready to go. And by the end of the day, I felt like someone shot me with bird shot. Just there's pellets and shells everywhere. And I'm like, I didn't get one thing accomplished, but everybody else did, seems like. And you stressed out, worried you're not going to get anything. You spend all day doing that. You finally get back in your car. You turn on that same news or same podcast that stressed you out on the way in so it could stress you out on the way home. You pick up the kids, you get to the house, you get dinner, you get the kids' homework done, or maybe you've got to get homework done. You finally get everybody to bed, you lay your head on the pillow, and you set the alarm clock to do it all over again the next day. When do you make time for God? Because the world is going to scream for your attention. They're going to clamor for all of your time. When do you take time and make God a priority? It will not just happen. The first thing the psalmist says is, like a deer pants for the water, I thirst for God. I need him. The water's life-giving to the deer. He says, I can't make it another day unless I get to the source of life itself, God. But you have to make God a priority. The second thing is, when you're in a spiritually dry season, remember when God was close. Remember when he was close. Verse four says this. He says, my heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowds of worshipers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. This is when the feast and the festivals were happening from all over Israel. They would travel down to Jerusalem, um, geographically speaking, but topologically speaking, they would then ascend up the mountain and go to Jerusalem, to the temple, and they would sing songs of praise. They would travel in groups and they would sing songs of praise, anticipate and going into the house of God and meeting with God. He says, I remember how it used to be and now I can't go there. And now I stand on the edge of this water and reminded that I can't go there anymore. But I remember how it used to be. I remember when I was close to God, he says. One of my favorite stories that my father, who passed it for years and years and years, um, he told that I never forget. There is an there was an elderly couple, and they're riding in this one of these old these these old pickup trucks. You know what I mean? You, you know what I'm talking about? So they're as wide as the stage, right? And they've got a bench seat. There's no console in the middle, just a bench seat. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that kind. Listen. My dad had one of those trucks, and, um, and um, I don't know if any of you remember. I'm really aging myself at this point. It didn't even have, it, it, it didn't even have a stick shift. It was a, it was a column shift. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Three gears, you bring it back, take it up, take it back, you know? In Mississippi, we called them three on a tree. You know what I mean? It's just three gears. It's all you had. All right. Long, wide, this old truck, this elderly couple's riding in this truck, and she's on one side, he's on the other, and she starts talking to him. She says, do you remember... When we were first married, yeah. She said, I used to ride right up next to you. You'd have your arm around me. And it was so romantic. We'd just get as close as possible and we'd just drive. And she said, what do you think happened? Well, there's a trap question for you. (laughs) But he looked at the steering wheel and the controls And he looked over to her and he said, 
Seems to me I ain't the one that moved. <laughs> How many times have we done that to God? God, you feel so far away from me. Where are you? And God is saying, I haven't moved. I'm still here. I remember living, my, it, was, it was the first year of um, marriage and we moved nine years away. I mean, nine hours away. <laughs> Felt like years. <laughs> Dog years, so there's that. We moved nine hours away, away from anybody we knew. And I was, uh, in, that, in, in that time, I was in the business world and I was um, charged with going over there. It was one of those deals they make you in business. You ever had those deals? We're going to give you a promotion. You ever had one of those? You know, and you go, wow, I'm going to get a promotion. And they said, we're going to take you from where you are. And instead of being an assistant manager, we're going to make you a manager of a store. And I went, a manager? And they said, yes. And they said, you're going to go to Valdosta, Georgia. <laughs> and we don't even have a store there. <laughs> we don't have a store within 120 miles. But you, my friend, are going to go make us a store over there. 6.30 in the morning, 9.30 at night. Just constant. Trying to dig out business. And it was one of those, it was one of those two where they said, listen, we're going to pay you a bigger percentage of the profits than you're making right now. And I went, hey. It was going to be more than triple the percentage of profits. I went, this is good. And then somewhere along the way in the moving truck over there, I went, you know, triple the percentage of nothing is still nothing <laughs> till we make some money. And so I was working hard trying to prove myself, get it established. I called my dad. He asked how I was doing. I said, I, and dad, I'm just depleted. I'm tired. I feel like I'm worn out. I feel like, I, I don't even feel like, I feel like I'm so far from God. I don't know what's going on. And he said, when did you last feel close to God? And I told him when. And then he said, what were you doing then? I said, well, I would get up about 30 minutes early, read my Bible, I pray. During the day, I'd take a moment just to pause and pray about decisions that were coming up in the afternoon. I would occasionally, even for a while, I would fast a meal. And there was a season there where I just felt like I was supposed to fast a certain day every week. And he said, are you doing those things now? I said, no. No, I'm not. And he said, Kirk, it seems to me that God hasn't changed anything. You have. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 4, in the first part of verse 5, Jesus is talking to one of the churches. He says this. He says, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. What did you do when you remember when you were close to God? Did you make time to read God's word every day? Did you pray every day? Did you make time to fast or other disciplines, spiritual disciplines regularly? Did you put God first in your finances, whether that's tithing or giving to God, or maybe that's even in purchases, asking God, hey, this is your money. You, you asked me to steward it. Is this a good purchase you want me to make, Lord? Now, look, I'm not talking about snacks or bubble gum. I'm talking about big purchases. But you prayed about them. I'm talking about generosity, where you remembered that you are not a reservoir of God's blessings, but you are a conduit of God's blessings, that he can move resources into you and also move them out to bless other people. What were you doing in those moments? Did you put God first in your relationships to do the first works? But listen to me, I don't want you to get confused about this. When I talk about spiritual disciplines, I don't want you to get confused with other things. Because sometimes we can get those things. We remember when we were close to God and we think something else was the reason why. 
Look, I remember during my first few years of, of um, out in the, um, uh, getting away from home, getting out into the real world, I remember there was a certain author that just just rocked my world. I mean, opened my mind to think and to, and, to, and to get a hold of God's grace and his mercy and his righteousness, all those things, and helped me understand it so much. I read every book he wrote for years. And then I went back a few years later after I'd grown and matured, and I read those books again, and I went, hmm, they don't mean as much now as they did then. It's, you know why? Because I needed them then more than I do now. God's were maturing me. Now I need something more. I need to feast on something different. I remember there was a certain season in my life when another author I began to read, and it, it, was, a, it was when I needed to make a decision in my life. It was also a time where I was being very legalistic in my own life, and God opened my eyes through this author. A few years later, I read that author again, and I went, well, it was good, but yeah. See, we attach certain things. If I would have attached my closeness to an author, I forget it's all about God. We do this with so many things. I remember a few years ago, I was uh, at another church, so not here, okay? Just, and I'm not saying the name of the church because they still watch sometimes, so. But I was at this church, and um, they were going through whatever I call, whatever you call worship war, styles of music change that was going on. And I get it. You get it. I mean, can we just be honest with each other right now? Can we do this? All right. How many of you have a favorite style of Christian music? Can I see your hand? You just have a favorite style. Yeah, we all do. Okay. Listen, and there's a favorite moment, a favorite or a very special window of time in your life where that music was very influential in your life. Okay. You all have it. It's typically... Right after you're first saved, it's typically in your early 20s. It's that, that's, that's when things start resonating in your life. So when I, same for me, got saved, early 20s. Got, and, and before I even went into ministry, um, it was the early 90s um, uh, uh, when I got saved and finally yielded my life to Christ. And I remember uh, there were a couple of things. Uh, there was uh, a man named Michael English. There was a group called For Him. There was a group called Point of Grace. All of these were very, very influential in my life. A few years later, God called me into ministry and I became a youth pastor. And so I thought, I'll bring this wonderful stuff to these youth. So I'm like, have y'all heard Michael English? And they're listening and they're going, um, nope. How about for him? They're like, nope. I'm like, really? This is life changing. They're like, dude, you heard of audio adrenaline? I mean, that, they're like, let's go here. And some of you are going, who's audio adrenaline? Don't worry about it. But I get it. At this other church, there was a man that came to me and he was not happy with certain decisions that were being made. And he said, listen, he said, I'm only trying to protect the doctrine of the church. And I said, I appreciate you being the theological bedrock of this church. And I said, what do you mean? He said, the old songs had theology. The new songs just repeat themselves over and over again. I said, Okay. I said, well, what songs meant the most to you? He said, man, back in the 80s and the early 90s, he said, there was a song. We'd sing it all the time here. He said, that's the kind of songs we need to sing. I said, okay, what was it? He said, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I said, is it the same one I'm thinking of? He said, yeah. I said, I like that song. I grew up on that song. I've been in church all my life. I said, but can we just recite those words together for the non-repetitive song? This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, don't go with the four-four timing over here. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord was made. And what we do when we finish that? We'd sing it again. <laughs> now, I'm not here to tell you that's a bad song. I grew up on that song. Listen to me. You're, you're, if you hear that, you're hearing me wrong. But there have been deep theological songs and repetitive songs in every generation. And what I had to tell him was, don't make a spiritual value on a personal preference that meant something to you during a moment in your life. 
Because if you do, you will turn your attention to that thing and make it an idol instead of turning your attention towards the God in heaven. This man says, I long to go to the temple. But do you know what he does? Eventually he goes, but, but, I can't get there, so I'll praise him where I am. The Bible tells us over and over again, one thing never changes. The same yesterday, today, forever. And it's the Lord. He is an ever-present help in times of trouble. Psalm 139 says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest sea oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. There is one thing consistent and it's not your circumstances, it's not your preferences, it's not the time or the day or the age in which you live. It is the Lord who never changes. And if you remember when you're close to the Lord, remember the things you did to draw near to him so he could draw near to you. The third thing is to fill your mind with God's promises. His promises. Look at what the psalmist does in verse 5. He says, I'll put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Now I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you, even from distant Mount Hermon, the source of the Jordan, from the land of Mount Mizar. What he's saying is this, I'm remembering you. I can't get down there, but I'm remembering you right here, right now. I remember your promises right where I am, right in the circumstances that I think are causing me to be distant from you. I'm going to remember you where I am. He says, I hear the tumult of the raging seas as your waves and your surging tides sweep over me, but... Each day, the Lord pours out his unfailing love upon me. And through each night, I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. This book is God's word filled with God's promises and God's character. And those promises aren't just for that person and that person and this person. They are for you and for me. They're not for super saints that you think have it all together. They are for all of us. And what does the Bible tell us that we can count on over and over again? That God is faithful. Listen to some of his words of promises of his faithfulness. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. Isaiah 40, 31 says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isaiah 43 and 2 says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned and the flames will not set you ablaze. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 says, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. 1 Peter 5 and 10 says, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Deuteronomy 7 and 9 says, know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his commandments. Numbers 23 and 19 says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and then not fulfill? And of course he says, no, absolutely not, because God is consistent. He is faithful. He is everlasting and he is unchanging. And if God makes a promise, God will always keep his promises. And one of his greatest promises that if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. The final thing is to put your hope in God. Verse five says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. He's just been talking about how he longs to go down. His circumstances are preventing him. Later on, he talks about all his enemies coming against him. 
And the same response we find in verse 11 says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. That phrase, put my hope, is the same phrase that is translated wait in other places. It literally, the root, it literally means to twist or to bind something, to wrap around something. To wait upon the Lord, to put your hope in the Lord is literally to wrap your life around the character and the promises of God. That you just don't read them on a page and go, I think that applies to me. You literally intertwine your life with the reality that God's character and his promises are real for your life. It's waiting with eagerness. It's active patience. It's waiting for God to move, and when he does, being ready to move with him, but also trusting him in the process. The psalmist is saying, I don't know when I'm going to be able to get back to the temple, but I will praise God in this place that feels far from him right here, right now. I don't know when God's going to change the people around me, but I will praise God in this place of discontent in my life. I don't know when my attitude and my countenance will change, but I will praise God even in the discouraging times. I don't know when I'll be able to to ascend the holy hill and get to the mountaintop where the temple is, but I will praise God in this valley until I do. I don't know when this is going to change, but I know I'm praising God in my circumstances now, and when he changes it, I'll praise him then. I'm waiting for God to move. I'm readying myself for God to move, and I'm praising God by faith even now, knowing that he's faithful to his promise. To put my hope in God is to intertwine my life with everything he's promised and basing my my whole life, my whole existence on God being faithful in that moment. The psalmist says, as a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. Can I just tell you something? You may long for him, but he's searching for you. In the very beginning in the book of Genesis, even when sin entered the world, God comes walking in the cool of the day. He says, Adam, where are you? Looking for him. At the very end of Scripture, in the book of Revelation, after giving all these exhortations and even warnings to the churches, in Revelations 3 and 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears me and opens up the door, I will come in and have a meal of fellowship as friends. If God feels distant, it's not because he's moved. Now, your circumstances may have caused you to inch away a little bit. Maybe it's like the psalmist. Someone he thinks is forbidding him to draw near to God, but then he realizes God has not just relegated that place. I can draw near to him right here, right now. I didn't feel led to say this in the first service. I think there's somebody here, you need to hear this. You think that someone is standing in your way. You think that the pain of what they've done and they're causing you to be far from God and you're blaming them. I can tell you there was a time in my life where someone did something to me that I felt far from God. And I went to the Lord and I just prayed and I was like, they are standing in my way. If God ever spoke to my heart, he said, Kirk, it's up to you how close you get to me. He said, if they're between me and you, you're allowing them to be closer to me than you are.
It's proximity. Don't allow anyone or any circumstance to stand in the way of you and God. And the only way to be intertwined is to start taking steps that move you from that side of that truck over to this side of the truck. God's waiting, standing at the door, knocking, ready. Will you bow your head and close your eyes all across the room? If you're here in this place and you are far from God and you know that based on your decisions, you're out of relationship with God. Today's the day to change that. Allow grace to catch up to you again. God has been searching from you for you all the way from Genesis to Revelation, even now. And if you know you're far from God, I want you to pray something like this with your heart and mean it. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you never give up on me. I thank you that what you did on the cross that we talked about earlier in this service was enough, giving your life for my sins. Forgive me for the way that I've lived. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from unrighteousness. And I ask you to become the leader and Lord of my life. I surrender. I am subjecting myself to your leadership and lordship. It's not my life anymore. It's yours. Do with me as you will. Now I'm going to ask everyone in the room, just pray this prayer profession. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Come on, one more time. Jesus, I give you my life. life. Now, your head's still bowed, your eyes still closed. No one but the ministry team and me looking around. If that's you, you know when you came in here this place this morning, things aren't right between you and the Lord. But you've made a decision to follow him for the first time or the first time in a long time. I'm not here to embarrass you, call you out. I do want to pray for you this week. It's important that you tell someone of this decision. But you say, when I came in here, things aren't right, but I'm following Jesus for the first time or the first time in a long time. If that's you... Will you just raise your hand really high while no one's looking around? Say, Pastor, that's me. God bless you. You're not alone. Just leave them up just a moment, please. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. You're not alone at all, at all. All right, you can put them down. If you're in this room and you say, Pastor, I'm in a spiritually dry place. Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but I feel, I don't feel as close as I once did, and I want to feel close to him. And I'm just confessing that I want you to agree with me in prayer that I'll draw near to him and he'll draw near to me. If that's you, would you just raise your hand really high just for a moment? God bless you guys. Amen. Amen. All right, you can put them down. Father, thank you. Thank you for grace that is provided through Jesus Christ. Thank you for those who made a decision to follow you, to become right, not because they're right, but because you've made them right through Christ our Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would, as you take the weight of sin off of them, that you would give them a spirit of joy. I pray that joy would just permeate their lives. And I pray that purpose and destiny would begin to fill them that would literally change the countenance of their face. For those who are here that say, I'm in a spiritually dry season, I pray that you draw them near and as they take active steps towards you, Lord, just as you've always done, meet them with open arms. For each of us, thank you for your word that reminds us that even when we feel far from you, you're always there. And for that, we give you praise in Christ's name. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask you if you would to, you should have received some elements when you came in to partake of Holy Communion. Um, If you did not receive elements when you came in, will you raise your hand really high so we can get those to you? Just leave them up really, just for a moment until someone comes and serves you. As they're coming, I want you to go and prepare your element, the elements that you have. Um, The clear seal at the top will will reveal the wafer and um, the seal under that will open the juice. It is an amazing thing that Jesus on the night before he gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins, 
that Jesus shares a Passover meal with his disciples. And he says, what you have once celebrated and remembered from thousands of years ago when God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. He said, I'm taking that and it's gonna be a remembrance from this day forward that I'm bringing you out of the bondage of sin and of shame and bringing you into the promise of hope and relationship with God the Father. Paul writes like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. He said, on the same night that the Lord was betrayed, he took bread and after he blessed it, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Would you remember the body of Christ? And in the same manner, he took the cup and said, this cup is my blood in the new covenant. Take and drink as often as you do in remembrance of me. Would you remember the blood of Christ? For as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for grace that is unending, for mercy that is everlasting. Thank you that you care enough for us that you do the work. We can't even come to you without the Holy Spirit drawing us. And then the work you did on the cross through your son, our savior, Jesus. And then you ask us to be holy even though we're incapable in and of ourselves of doing that. So you give us the Holy Spirit in, in order to live holy. And you invite us to wait, to put our hope in you, not just for this life, but also in eternity that you're preparing for us. So Lord, thank you that what we wrap our lives around, what we intertwine our faith in is bedrock. It's concrete, it's foundational is that you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we thank you for that. We rely on that. We hope in that. We give you praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, can you celebrate with me today? 14 people gave their hearts to Christ in this place, amen. Come on, amen. Amen. If you made that decision today or in the last few weeks, man, we'd love to help you get started on this walk with Jesus. Our grow team will be down front. Um, you can make your way to them. Maybe one of our ministry uh, team will um, just come up to you, congratulate you for that, see if we can help you in any way. Or you can just uh, drop by the connection point out in the atrium. We'd love to talk with you there. If, in fact, you would like more information about getting plugged in here at Mount Perrin North, um, there's a card in front of you or a QR code on the seat back in front of you. Just fill out the connect card. Walk it out to Connection Point, and we'd love to help you just get plugged in. Find your gifts, your talents, your abilities, your passions, all those things um, that God has created you for and get you plugged in uh, and, and utilizing those gifts as well. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. Guess what? Four weeks from today is what? Easter. Easter. That is right. Easter Sunday. So... Listen, 82% of people say they will come to an Easter or Christmas service if they are invited by someone. 82% of people. So listen, I wanna pack the house, but I need you to hear me. I don't wanna pack the house to make me feel better about numbers. These are your friends, these are your families with a life and a purpose here and a destiny and an eternity that awaits. And I'm gonna be praying for you. I want you to be begin to think, who am I gonna invite? And also, Lord, I want you to prepare that service that day for the Holy Spirit to draw them to you and do what only God can do in those moments. Can you agree with me on that? Amen. 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 I believe God's going to do something real and substantial that day. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Let's give our response from Psalm 19. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. God bless you folks. Love you. Have a great day.